So um, my project is about mode shift and um, travel mode is how you go from A to B and the, the choice you make um, or the habit that you have of um, traveling. And it's usually measured through trips and how those trips are accomplished. Um, so when I talk about mode shift, I'm talking about the proportion percentage of trips undertaken using different methods of travel. And um, my project is about accelerating cycling adoption. And we're trying to get more people to ride bikes and to travel for, not for recreation, but for uh, utilitarian purposes using bicycles. And this is an academic, it started as an academic project. We've been funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. So the first thing we wanted to do was understand the travel patterns that we have because we felt that they hadn't been very well understood taking cycling into account. We wanted to figure out how we could encourage people to change those travel modes and we did um, a study I'll describe briefly. We then wanted to um, develop a test kit and actually apply it, try it out, see how it worked, measure the outcomes and disseminate it further. So this is a relatively um, recent project. So we're still, we're at the dissemination phase, but we're still learning all the time and tweaking what we're doing and trying to make it better and have it be adopted more broadly in a better way. Uh, transportation here in Canada is a segment of GHG emissions that is continuing to grow. It's really, really important, um, particularly for us in such a big country that's quite spread out where we have quite low densities. So we were explicitly trying to understand how to take the lessons that C was really summarizing for us this morning. And they have been largely developed in the healthcare field for a tobacco cessation, for example, but also for um, the kind of building energy projects that we've been talking about and how those can be transferred um, successfully to what has always been thought of as a much thornier, more difficult issue, which is mode choice. Because when we choose how to travel, there are many things that go along with that choice. You know, um, I'm wearing pants today, I'm wearing trousers. There's a reason for that. I have a bar across my bicycle and it's a whole lot easier to not wear a skirt. And so there are lots of little choices about how we get our groceries, what we put on in the morning, you know, where our kids go to school and how they go to school. All these choices that are quite central to our lives that come along with travel behavior that don't come along when you switch off a, a light switch. And so it's always been thought of as really difficult and you know, I thought that'd be interesting. And um, I wanted to also fill a gap in the literature because there's not been much work in this area and I was really interested in looking at it for that reason. And so, um, as C talked about, we don't have great models for this. This is something that was developed by my colleague Lake Sagaras, who's now in Chile. And um, I like it. It's sort of somewhere in between, um, I hope Lake's name is on your picture. Uh, it's somewhere, it, it's really a social change model, but it's recognizing that in the area of cycling, the urban measures are really important. They have been very extensively researched. So people know about the width of a bike lane and the differences between, you know, separated cycle tracks and painted bike lanes. And they've done lots of research on all of that. Um, and as with uh, building energy technology, um, it hasn't been a case of build it and they will come. I don't know how many of you have traveled along Highway 7 north, the north end of our city, but there's a bike lane, believe it or not, on Highway 7. Well, I've never seen any cyclists on it. So when you do those kinds of urban measures, that isn't alone going to change how people behave, even though a lot of people think if you want to get people to cycle, you just build more cycling lanes or bike tracks. Bob's your uncle. Well, it isn't. He isn't. Um, so you also have to look at, and this is what they call materials, um, and we call cycling economy. One of our research areas that I'm not going to talk about is the relationship between business and cycling, um, which is very mutually enforcing, um, and that isn't widely known. But the goods and services necessary for people to cycle are 
an absolutely critical part of this that we've been looking at. It hasn't been very much examined. And the behavior change has almost not been examined at all. So that's where we've really focused the majority of our efforts. Um, we have in Toronto, as in um, North America, generally been experiencing a dramatic change in the way we travel. Cycling has become, you know, incredibly much more popular. So over the five-year period from 2006 to 2011, we have a 63 percent increase in cycling in Toronto. Um, automobile driving has gone down by 4%, which is significant because our city has grown during this period. So this is more and more people are traveling, but proportionately many, many fewer than 4% um, are choosing not to do it in cars. Um, we have a slight decrease in walking um, and an increase in transit, and despite the um, appalling conditions that you experience using the transit here in Toronto, which I think is the biggest driver actually for cycling uptake. But anyhow, <laughs> it's not the topic of this conversation. So um, we, th we started by looking at where people cycle and how they cycle and what are the, the um, correlating factors. So we've mapped out where people cycle. The top map is Toronto 2006. You can see that, does this thing beam if I press something? It does. Okay, so you can see that here, which is um, west of the center of town, is the um, cycling hotspot. It remains that way. More people than ever cycle there now in 2011. And this, I have to say, this is a great database, but it really sucks for cycling. So we think these are gross underestimates of um, cycling mode share. Um, but the interesting thing between those two dates is that where cycling grew, even though, as I just showed you, it was increasing here um, and here, it has increased even more dramatically by over 100%. These are small numbers in some cases in the midtown area and some of the outlying areas. So cycling, um, happily, is increasing dramatically you know, in many areas of the city, not just in the downtown. However, there is a pattern that emerges that in the suburbs, it's um, only barely increasing when that is compared with the more downtown grid-like core of the city. So that would include, um, so the orange line there is everything inside that purple dotted line. So it includes midtown as well as downtown in the city. So we have a problem and we're, so our project now is focusing almost exclusively on low density suburban areas. So what we started out was trying to figure out who's cycling and what characterizes those trips, what's associated with higher rates of cycling. And um, I'm going to go through these quickly because I don't want to go over time. Uh, so the uh, people cycle disproportionately compared to um, the population uh, in the age groups of 25 to 55. And so it's middle-aged people who are doing a disproportionate amount of cycling. Two out of three cycling trips in the city are undertaken by men. That's a very common that men are the predominant cyclists. However, the good news is that in the areas where cycling is actually very popular and we have in some census tracts, we actually started looking at the census tracts, which is very, very small neighborhoods. Um, we have over 20% of trips are undertaken by bikes. So there, there are areas of the city where many people are using bikes as their primary form of transportation. And in areas where cycling is popular, 50% of the trips are undertaken by women. So it's really interesting that women are sort of a bellwether for um, how acceptable or safe cycling is seen to be. So it's really important to look at the gender ship split. Trip lengths um, for cyclists are generally under five kilometers or seven kilometers if you're willing to put in a little bit um, more sweat into it. But interestingly, the majority of the trips in Toronto are under seven kilometers. And so as you can see, even for cars, and that's yellow, can see what the peak 
travel distances for trips undertaken by car, the, the peak is still under three kilometers. So we make many, many, many trips um, by car, by transit that could be undertaken uh, using active transportation. So trip length is a really critical datum for us. We thought population density would be critically important, but as you can see, the areas with the highest population density do not have the highest rate of cycling, although they aren't far. Destination density is much more important, so this is the density of uh, employment areas, um, things like institutions, educational institutions, and that is indeed very, very important for determining uh, cycling mode share, and it's really the the distances between um, origins and destinations that has to be under five to seven kilometers and so that's really critical and we found that the density of cycling service facilities pretty accurately tracks um, the mode share. What doesn't track mode share is the cycle lanes that we have, the pathways um, in Toronto because our uh, planners have been quite conflict averse. We haven't had a lot of political support for cycling and so our bike trails are mainly in ravines and places where drivers won't object to them being there and they don't take any weight road space and so when we did, um, which we did a, a look at the, um, we have walk share, we also a uh, walk score, we also have a bike score and it does not correlate at all because it's based in part on the um, on these separated bike lanes. So we found that there are eight important characteristics, age, sex, trip length, trip frequency, um, some land use factors like density, which are really land use determined, um, and topography, which we can't do a whole lot about. We're on the lake shore and we do have hills. Not weather. Uh, yes, whether it, we were, most of our data comes from spring and fall surveys, primarily fall surveys. So people who do this kind of study in the winter don't get good results. Um, and there are, and there's an increasing number of people who cycle in the winter here, but that's not, you don't get, all the data have been collected September, October, those kinds of times, all the reputable data. Because in Wellington, the first thing you do in the morning before you get on a cycle is check the wind speed. Oh, I see. Well, there are many, many people here who stop cycling in December or even November, but there are also many people who do not. And um, we recently won, there's a really great story about how we won winter maintenance of our bike paths, which I can tell later if anybody wants to hear about it. It's a fabulous story. So we decided that we should be directing all of this was about targeting. We wanted to target our programs at neighborhoods and communities that would be susceptible to change. There's no point, we've seen so many failed programs and we didn't want to be one of them. So all of this was about targeting and we've decided we should be directing our programs at the people most likely to take up cycling, where cycling is possible in areas with medium to high population density, a high destination density, medium to high cycling service facility density, and relatively lov level terrain where, and the most important thing that C emphasized, is there are, are strong community partners that um, will, will work with us. So um, this is just a few additional factors. We um, developed a behavior change toolkit for cycling adoption. It was based on a very thorough review of the academic literature, looking at both um, the uh, sort of so like the tools that have been developed, as well as the case studies. We found very few, sadly, case studies that had been monitored where we could really use the results. But um, from the few that we could correlate with the tools, we developed uh, a toolkit. Um, it's nothing terribly original, but it's worked for us. It's built around community-based partnerships. We segment the target population. That is the piece that has been, I'd say, the most important. We look at and remove barriers. We do use commitment strategies. They've been shown to be effective, and we sustain the change. So we've used, we've used, we haven't used stickers actually, but we use um, key rings. Attention, please, Dr. Roshan Rantic, liver transplant to 7A stack. And uh, we use commitment heavily, so people make public pledges. Transplant to 
seven eight staff uh, to participate in our program. And we've now done a number of these uh, interventions, working with uh, our partner, our partners in the community. Our most successful interventions have been with the Bike Host program run by Culture Link, which is a settlement organization. So it's a very unlikely partner. They are there, funded largely by Immigration Canada, to help newcomers to Canada, to Toronto, um, get to know the city and feel comfortable. And they have a bike host program which has been um, highly successful, which provides bicycles to newcomers and um, helps them to plan routes and to find their way around the city and to make new friends. I'm just going to show you some of the results of that program. I'm going to zoom through it. So. Uh, we had a five-fold increase in the number of utilitarian trips, and this was true for people who had access to bikes even before our program began. Um, so that was pretty gratifying for us. So you can see that the change in the sort of yellowy-orange segment is the cycling mode share. It's dramatically increased. Same for shopping. And the willingness to spend money on a bicycle greatly increased. And that was very important because we provided these people with bicycles. So if they were going to continue that behavior, they needed to get their own. But they got to the point that they were willing to invest the money needed. Um, and you can see this is our 2013-2014 data in all cases. You know, $181 will buy you a bike or $220. And $67 for accessories will get you maybe not a great lock, but it'll get you locked. And uh, people, attitudes follow behaviors, um, so people feel comfortable riding a bike afterwards, and um, you can see that the orange strongly agree increased. So before is the top, after is, this, is um, the second bar, the third bar is before for 2013 and after. Um, so they also were less anxious about having their bike stolen after they learned how to lock it securely. Um, they felt that the new social norm was established and that was one of our most important findings. Um, but this, I think, was one of the, probably our most important finding um, that we've been slow to recognize, is that they came into these programs not to um, take up cycling. They came into our programs because they wanted to meet new people. These are folks who've just arrived in the country. They want to meet new people and they want to get to know their city. And they like to have safe cycling skills, but really it's a means to an end. Well, at the end, they felt that the really important benefit for them was the safe cycling skills. They felt like this was something that they really gained. They also met new people and got to know Toronto. But they were not motivated because they were, you know, they had green views. They were motivated because they wanted to get to know people in their city and to know their city. Oops. What's happening here? So um, we had dramatic changes in behavior, a five-fold increase in cycling that um, we are measuring just this summer to make sure that it has been persistent. We're going back to our participants from last year and the year before to find out whether they're continuing to cycle. But based on their commitment to buying a bike or participating in bike share, um, we expect that that is something that they are going to um, be continuing. So we'll find that out for sure later this year. Um, we saw that following the behavior change, there were changes in attitudes, changes in willingness to pay, changes, importantly, in social norms. And these are people who are at, um, as C mentioned, at one of those moments in their lives when everything's changing for them. So they're very open to change. They've just moved to a whole new country. Many have come from very difficult situations in their countries of origin. They're willing, they want to become Canadian. They're willing to take up new habits in order to become Canadian. And they made a commitment to that by immigrating. And so um, we've seen really big changes in social norms. We're very happy about that. We hope to be able to measure whether those have proliferated, whether there's not only persistence over time, but proliferation <coughs> of other kinds of habits. So we'll be testing for that. Um, and of course, dramatic changes in cycling behavior. Um, I haven't talked about the cycling economy, but we have done really Real, I have a wonderful student who's done really interesting work on that and on overcoming barriers and looking at some of those very vociferous opponents to cycling infrastructure. 
um, and in Toronto, as in many places in North America, business improvement areas have been vociferous in fighting bike lanes on the grounds that often parking is, street parking um, is a victim of that and they think they're going to lose customers. So we've studied that quite intensively and found out that in fact business revenues go up with cycling lanes in front of their main street stores and that's been another important stream of our research findings. So we found that behavior change initiatives can significantly accelerate cycling adoption at a fraction of the cost of physical infrastructure. And I want to emphasize that these changes have been taking place in a city that was actively dismantling cycling infrastructure. In the 2013, we had lost the Jarvis bike lane. Um, Sherburne wasn't yet in. We didn't have our downtown Adelaide and Richmond. Um, for those of you from Toronto, bike lane, Shaw Street wasn't there. So this was, a, this is a, was at the time of our work, a city that had marginal cycling infrastructure. I mean, really marginal. Even now, I would say we have very marginal cycling infrastructure. It is not a prerequisite for change. We have one of the largest, possibly the largest cycling mode share in North America, here in, Tor in downtown Toronto. They, we don't see that because it's measured differently because we have such a big city and small places that write a line around their downtown area have ostensibly much higher mode share than us, but that's because we include Etobicoke in the city. So um, our lessons are that we need to target those who are most prepared to change behavior and prepared to establish new social norms within their communities. That motivation also dera often derives from unrelated uh, but consonant goals, as she was talking about. Um, we think that having fun is actually a really important part of program design. So um, the program that Emma Kohlmeyer put together for us that we have been using ever since here, we really should put in the middle with community-based partnerships, we should put fun because actually our program is designed around having fun. And there's lots of other things that we try and accomplish, but it's a failure if people don't have a good time. And so that is really one of our key values. And um, the other is the community-based partnerships. I didn't go into them at great length, but they have been you know, probably the most rewarding um, partnerships of my whole career. And adaptability is the other uh, message that we've taken from the, these are very uh, context specific. So for each of these four stages, we have built a whole string of options so that different communities can choose from that string of options what would work best in their situation and pick and choose and, and have what we hope will be an effective program. So let me just get back to where I was. So, um, so I have uh, zoomed through our findings, but this has been uh, a really, it's been a very fun experience for me. It's been great to work with a settlement organization, and I think that we've learned a lot of lessons. And one of the things I want to emphasize for you folks who are mostly looking at buildings energy use is when I went into this, I thought it was going to be a really hard not to crack, and that compared to the ease of switching off a light, that um, getting people to ride a bike, which is such a, it's, it's um, such a core part of how we identify their, ourselves and what we do with our time. I thought it'd be very difficult. And so I've been very gratified to find out that we can do this, that we can do this consistently, we can do this and have fun at the same time, we can meet new people, and um, it's, so it's been an extremely gratifying uh, experience. And I, um, so I urge people to, really take seriously behavior change programs and not just look at the kind of mega programs that are most easily funded because these kinds of small, have very, I mean, you have to be very sophisticated in your targeting, but when you do that, you can have a really big impact. So I would love to hear people's comments and questions.